。为期三天的亚洲安全会议——香格里拉对话，虽然已经落幕，但是美中国防部长在会议当中针对台海的议题可以说是激烈的交锋。中国国防部长魏凤和在会议当中表示，解放军不惜为台湾一战，台湾海峡属于中国，美舰不应该穿越巡逻。不过对此，美国防长奥斯汀回应。美舰穿越台海是自由航行的权利，中国无权干涉。美国国务院发言人普莱斯在几天之后，更对路透社表示，台湾海峡是公海自由区域，有航行和飞越的自由。该如何来解读这场美中日益紧绷、剑拔弩张的关系？台海是否已经成为美中冲突的风暴中心呢？对此，我们特别独家访问到了美国川普政府时期的国防部长 Mark Esper 艾斯培部长。艾斯培曾任美国国防部长以及美国陆军部长，参与川普执政时期许多非常重要的决策。我们非常荣幸能够和艾斯培岳阳视讯连线，和他一起来剖析美中台关系的变化以及未来。Secretary, it's my greatest honor to have you on my show, Rebecca's Face to Face with the World. So, would you like to say hi to your friends here in Taiwan, please? Yes, hello, Rebecca. First of all, great to be with you, and、uh, great to have a chance to talk with your wonderful audience. Thank you. And firstly, let me thank you for your strong support for Taiwan. So I would like to start our interview today with a question regarding the relations between the United States and Taiwan. We all know that ever since President Biden took office, he said a couple of times when answering questions from the press that the U.S. would defend Taiwan if it was attacked by China. But then the White House immediately clarified that the U.S. policy towards Taiwan remained unchanged. Mr. Secretary, what do you make of the current U.S. policies towards China and Taiwan? Well, first of all, I'd say that the relationship between the United States is strong and it is strengthening. It began in the last administration, the one that I served in, based on a number of things that myself and Secretary Pompeo and others had initiated. And then under this administration, I hope it will continue to grow. I was actually pleased to see what President Biden had said. I thought it was a very honest moment. I think it was a very bold statement. He said it three times.、Uh, I don't understand why the White House has tried to clarify it or walk it back, but that, well, clearly we are in a different state of affairs, and I think less ambiguity is more important these days than what it was in the past.、Mm -hmm. I see. The Shangri-La dialogue just concluded, and the United States called upon China not to undermine the cross-strait stability. And the Chinese Defense Minister expressed right immediately that it would go to war if necessary. So, how would you respond? Well, look, we clearly see the Chinese over the past few decades, and certainly over the past several years since、uh, Xi Jinping has come to power,、uh, using much more bellicose language with regard to.、Uh, Taiwan and the issues between our countries, and also、uh, using、uh, a greater display of military force. So we know, you know, the incursions that are happening on a near daily basis、uh, by the Chinese、uh, Air Force、uh, or the PLA Navy、uh, into Taiwan airspace or naval space it continues to grow. And this、uh, this language that he uses is is very problematic. It is a deviation from what we、uh, had had agreed upon many years ago, going back to. The Taiwan Re Relations Act, and it shows、uh, uh, what you know. It shows the real、uh, what's behind the Chinese intentions with regard to this matter, and it's why we need to stand firm against、uh, Chinese aggression. So. We are both alumni of the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, and our esteemed professor Graham Allison wrote about the Sussex trap, which means when a great power's position as hegemony is threatened by an emerging power, there is a significant likelihood of war between the two powers. Do you think the United States and China will go to war eventually, and can the war be prevented, and how? Well, it may be likely, but it's not、uh, inevitable. And so I think, look, China is clearly on the rise. We've seen the the growth in many different ways, and they are an ascending power, and and that's fine. But they need to do so within the international rules that exist, and the the laws, and the norms, and expectations of、uh, governments around the world. So what we're talking about now is not just about China's rise, but it's its rise within a dem democratic framework 
uh, established in, in the wake of World War II. So we need to accommodate that uh, rise. We need to work with them. We hopefully shape them toward a better outcome. Uh, so war isn't inevitable. That said, uh, while we hope for the best, we need to prepare for the worst. So that means we need to strengthen our military capabilities around the world, and not just the United States, but Taiwan, Taiwan and our partners and allies in the region as well. And we also need to bolster our uh, uh, State Department, our diplomatic efforts, and do all those things that will help us compete better against the Chinese in the years ahead. Talking about war, the war between Russia and Ukraine has continued for over 100 days. And in your view, how long will the war last? And who is likely to win the war? Some people say that Russia is now trapped in a war with Ukraine, which gives the U.S. more time to deal with China and the Indo-Pacific region. What do you make of this comment? And do you agree with that? Well, first of all, it's been a strategic failure by Vladimir Putin on uh, multiple fronts. I, I said this from day one. He's managed to uh, unify NATO. He's managed to push Ukraine closer to the West. He's managed to uh, get more troops into on his borders, now soon to include Sweden and Finland. So it's been a strategic failure. However, at the operational tactical level, it looks like it's grinding into a stalemate. Uh, Vladimir Putin may gain uh, the Donbass. We'll see what happens in the coming weeks. I suspect this will last for many months until Putin reaches the point that he decides to declare success. But that doesn't mean that the Ukrainians will accept that. They've shown a lot of courage, a lot of grit, a lot of competency on the battlefield. So, look, I think this will go on for many months. And uh, the United States, I hope, will stand firm behind them as a democracy, just like I hope and believe we should stand firm behind Taiwan as a democracy. And, look, I think there are important lessons here in this conflict uh, for, for both Beijing and Taipei. And uh, this will play out over time. I think clearly we overestimated Russia's capabilities. And hopefully uh, it will free us up to focus more on the Indo-Pacific. Mm. How do you see America's strategy and military deployment towards Ukraine? If you were still uh, Secretary of Defense, what would you do? And some of the military facilities in Ukraine were provided by the United States during your term as Secretary of Defense. And you even visited Ukraine. Did you foresee the possibility of war in the region, even though back at that time, President Trump kept claiming that he had a very good relations with President Putin? Well, we, we did know that there was always the possibility of an expanded conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Of course, Russia uh, invaded Georgia in 2008, invaded Ukraine in 2014. It took Crimea and Donbass. So it was something that we were on guard against, and I give President Trump credit for providing the Ukrainians with lethal military means to defend themselves. Again, important in the context of our obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act as well. Um, that said, I, my view has been that we should move NATO forces, U.S. forces spe specifically, closer to the Russian border along the Baltic states, into Poland and elsewhere. I talk about this in my book, The Need to Do So. That said, I don't think we need more U.S. troops in Europe. I, mm -hmm. I think we have a sufficient numbers particularly seeing the dismal performance by the Russian army against the Ukrainian. We have more than enough force in Europe. I think, again, instead, we need to focus our capabilities in the Indo-Pacific region, particularly as I describe in my book, um, um, A Sacred Oath, I believe that Northeast Asia is the greatest strategic flashpoint facing the world in the years and decades to come, whether it's uh, on the Korean Peninsula, whether it's in the Taiwan Strait, uh, or whether it's with Japan, uh, North, uh, Northeast Asia is the flashpoint, I think, for the world because of the great consequences that a conflict in that part uh, of the region would, would impact around the world globally. Yeah, if President Trump still were the president now, do you think the war between Russia and Ukraine could be prevented? And what do you think of the approaches taken by the incumbent U.S. government in dealing with Russia and Ukraine? You know, the first part of that question is an unknown. Uh, so many things have happened. It's not just that President Trump mm -hmm. uh, left office, but uh, Angela Merkel, uh, yes. uh, arguably the head of Europe, uh, left the world stage uh, late last year and other things had transpired. So we don't know what the calculations were for, for Vladimir Putin. You know, with regard to this administration, I, I think they had a slow start, a mixed start. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I thought they should never take military options off the table. I thought we should have provided the Ukrainians with MiG fighters and other things much and other equipment much sooner. But I think at this point, we're in a better position. Uh, the West remains unified. I get concerned about the Europeans getting wobbly. And, and so I think the, the challenge here will be maintaining this, uh, this coalition to support uh, Ukraine in the months ahead and to continue to oppose 
Russia, both diplomatically and with sanctions. That will be the challenge. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, you just mentioned you recently published a book titled A Secret Oath, which reveals the shocking details while serving in the Trump administration. How was your experience working in the Trump administration in that extraordinary times? Well, first, it was an extraordinary privilege for me to serve once again my country. I, I began at the age of 18 when I went to West Point and served on active duty in the United States Army. And then, of course, in other jobs uh, between uh, now and then. But it was a great honor and a privilege. Uh, the, the job in and of itself is always with enormous challenges, uh, dealing with both our adversaries abroad and our allies and partners. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the Trump White House made it more complicated because it was quite unpredictable and chaotic at mm -hmm. times. And I talk about this in great detail in the book. And, and, and again, I emphasize uh, an entire chapter I commit to the China problem that we faced and relations with Taiwan. Yeah. What motivated you to publish this book? And have you ever faced any pressures asking you not to publish the book? And when serving as Secretary of Defense, what were the greatest difficulties you ever encountered? And were the difficulties mainly caused by President Trump? Well, I was never asked not to publish a book. I always felt uh, after I left office that it was important to tell this story. It was so critical to American his history that I thought the American people should know what happened mm -hmm. during this very consequential time in their, uh, again, in their history. And I, I, I think I could add an important po voice to it, not just uh, as another cabinet member, but as the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of a Department that the President often turned to when he needed, uh, you know, action, whether it was dealing with adversaries abroad, whether it was, uh, you know, border security on the southwest border, dealing with COVID, uh, you know, dealing with unrest, you name it, the President often turned to us. So. We had our particular challenges. I, I chronicle it in detail there, but I thought it's important for history for people to know and for people to learn, um, you know, uh, where I where I did well, where I didn't do as well, and uh, where we made a lot of advances in terms of modernizing our military for the years ahead. Mr. Secretary, so now comes the question. President Trump has shown his ambition to make a comeback for 2024. Mr. Secretary, if President Trump really runs in 2024 again as a Republican, will you support him? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I, I am a Republican, and I, I like to describe myself as a Reagan Republican because I believe strongly in what Ronald Reagan stood for. And uh, it certainly had, he had an impact on my life. He had an impact on the United States at an important time of our history. And he was a, you know, a great friend of Taiwan, I think, as well. So I'm a Reagan Republican. You know, if uh, Donald Trump runs for office again, I will not support him. Uh, I, I think we need a new generation of leaders who can not only advance uh, traditional conservative uh, policies and principles, uh, but also do so in a way that brings people together, that is not coarse and divisive, and that can grow the Republican base in a way that will help us win elections. Look, it does, you can have all the great policies and ideas you want, but if you can't win an election and govern, then you can't advance them. And I'm, I don't uh, believe that Donald Trump is that person. I think there are future Republican leaders out there that can do far better. Yeah, so you will expect a new generation of Republicans to come out. So now some people have compared Taiwan to Ukraine as both countries where are facing the threat from their big neighbors. Now the United States and Taiwan have maintained closer cooperation in trade and technology. What should the U.S. and Taiwan do together to prevent China's aggression? Well, I think we need to continue to uh, build relationships between our peoples at multiple levels. And uh, in, in terms of the, the security aspect of it, continue to, uh, you know, continue arm sales uh, and training and, and the things that are important. I, I think Taiwan, of course, needs to spend more on its defense and spend more on the right things. Uh, I, I hope uh, you will follow the example of Ukraine in terms of building uh, strong, capable territorial defenses. I know that's under discussion now uh, at, at the governmental level. I think that's very important. I, look, the more that Taiwan can do to defend itself and make itself an unattractive target, if you will, for the Chinese, uh, the more you will deter uh, an incursion or some type of aggression by them, and also at the same time, uh, give the United States and, and your other partners and allies time to help respond. So I think all these things work together. Those discussions uh, should continue. And uh, what we want to do is avoid war. And we want to make sure that uh, Taiwan can continue to develop and uh, along the path it's on. And you've, it, it's shown to be a robust democracy with a great uh, economy and wonderful technology and uh, you know, a thriving cultural aspect that uh, we all have much to admire. Yeah, to avoid the war. 
Thank you so very much, Mr. Secretary, for spending your precious time with us and your valuable points of view. And most importantly, we thank you for your strong support for Taiwan. We hope to see you very soon and read your book here in Taiwan. Thank you so much. Thank you and goodbye.